Hello and welcome to this Leave and Cert Physics video. Today we are going to discuss the topic of refraction, which I'm ho I hope you can see from this picture is uh, pretty obvious. Okay. <clears throat> so some of our learning intentions that we need to achieve in order to have a good understanding of this chapter is our definitions, refraction, the two laws of refraction, Snell's law, the refractive index, what is a critical angle, and total internal reflection. So there's a few definitions that we need to go through in this chapter. We're going to differentiate between real depth and apparent depth. We're going to demonstrate uh, refraction, Snell's law, the refractive index, and total internal reflection, and list some practical effects due to refraction. Okay. So... What is refraction of light? I'm hoping you've seen from the first picture, there's something funky going on here in this picture, and we're gonna have a look at what it is. <clears throat> refraction is the bending of light when it goes from one medium to another. So in our first picture that we looked at there, we could see light was being bent as it traveled from the water through the air to our eyes. So the light was being bent in, a, in some way, which made it appear like this man's head was not on his body. Of course we know, we hope that's not true. Um, okay, so the bending of light when it goes from one medium to another is called refraction. And we can see this quite obvious in our first diagram on the left. What we've got is our setup here where we've got a ray box and we've got a light beam traveling from the ray box and as it hits the glass block, it starts to bend at this point, okay? Then as it's traveling through the glass block, it travels in a straight line again, until again, it travels from one medium to another. In this case, it's going from glass back out to air, and refraction occurs again for the second time. So we've got refraction occurring at two points here in this diagram. If we have a look at the picture on the right, we can see that the light ray does not bend in any way or it does not refract because the light ray is hitting the glass block at a 90 degree angle and it will not uh, bend in this instant. Okay, so some terminology that we need to be familiar with throughout this chapter. First up, we've got our air where the light ray is traveling from into our glass block. Second up, we've got this yellow line, sorry, excuse me, this yellow line, which is an imaginary line that we just placed there at 90 degrees to the glass block where the incident ray hits the glass block. So we can see at this point, we call this the point of incidence, and we've got our yellow line, which is an imaginary yellow line that we sketch, sketch at 90 degrees to the point of incidence, okay? We've got our incident ray, our incident light ray coming in, striking the glass block at the point of incidence, and we've got our refracted ray traveling through the glass block, okay? So the refracted ray is the light ray that has been bent as it's traveling through the glass. Second and third thing to, or third and fourth thing to note of much importance is our angle of incidence I, and our angle of refraction or now it's very very important that we remember you measure that angle of incidence i we measure it back to that imaginary normal line um imaginary normal line the yellow line and we measure our refracted angle back to that yellow line as well we do not measure this angle of incidence back to the glass block or in this case the refracted ray back to the glass block you always measure the angle towards the normal. So we've got two laws of refraction. The first law being that the incident ray, the normal at the point of incidence and the refracted ray all lie in the one plane. And our second law, which is Snell's law really, the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is a constant. Now, what does that mean? Basically, the second law refers to this formula here that the sine of the angle I over sine of the angle R 
it will always give you a constant number n n const n is a constant meaning that that number does not change okay so we're going to have a look at how we can verify Snell's law how we can verify that second law of refraction and what we're going to do is set up this experiment where we take a glass block and we shine a light ray into it and again we've got this dotted blue line an imaginary blue line which is our normal at 90 degrees at the point of incidence okay we're going to trace our glass trace our glass block out onto the paper and we're going to shine our light ray through the block we must make sure it's an acute angle with the surface of the block and we draw the normal which is that imaginary line at 90 degrees to the point of contact um, using a ruler so this is what our investigation is going to look like so far um, the incoming ray traces out our incident ray and the angle it makes with the normal is called our angle of incident that's that angle i up here the ray in the glass is called the refracted ray and the angle that it makes to the normal is called the angle of refraction which i'm circling right now um just a quick prediction um you guys hopefully have carried out these experiments in in class um but i'm asking you to predict what do you think will happen if angle i increases and the answer would be that angle or increases as well um if angle or decreases what will happen to angle i it will decrease as well um okay we'll continue on so when light travels from a rarer to a denser medium it is refracted towards the normal so let's have a look at the diagram on the left here we've got our incident ray coming in and if it was to travel in a straight line it would continue the line of my pointer however we can see that the light ray has been bent in towards the normal so when it's going from a less dense material to a more dense material the light ray will bend in towards the normal so for example if it's going from air to water or air to glass it will bend in towards the normal however in the diagram on the right when the light travels from a denser material to a less dense material rather than continuing on on a straight path like so as if that's the line that it would take following my laser pointer if it was traveling in a straight line rather than doing that it's bent or refracted away from the normal so things to note when going from a more dense to a less dense it's bent away from the normal and when it's going from a less dense to a more dense material it's bent in towards um towards the normal so how are we going to investigate snell's law well we've outlined our glass block on our piece of paper we've shone our instant ray in at an angle i to the normal and we can see that it's got a refracted angle or to the normal as well we're going to measure that incident angle i using a protractor we're going to measure this refracted angle or using a protractor and we're going to repeat this six times for six different values when you do so you're hopefully going to get a table of results that something similar to this so if we go about plotting these results by ourselves we see that we do not get a straight line graph okay which is an issue because if you have not got a straight line you cannot get a slope of that line because the slope varies at every point along the graph however if we get sign of our incident values and sign of our refracted values and plot sine i versus sine r well now all of a sudden we've got a straight line graph through the origin and we can therefore find the slope of this graph so 
From the graph, we can see that the sine of the angle of incidence is directly proportional to the sine of the angle of refraction. That's what this symbol here means, that they're directly proportional to each other. Now, because just because they're proportional to each other does not mean that they're equal to each other. However, if we include a constant number, n, we can say that sine i is equal to sine r multiplied by a constant number n. Okay. So from the graph, we can see that the sine of the angle of incidence is directly proportional to the sine of the angle of refraction. So if we put sine i on our y-axis, we put sine r on our x-axis, well then m, the slope of the graph, will be equals to n, our refractive index. Okay. This, so the slope of the line is known as the refractive index of the material. It is a unitless measurement that tells us how much a light ray will be refracted or how much it will be bent as it moves from one medium to another. Okay. So there again is our first law of refraction. We can see that our incident ray, our angle of incidence, our normal, our refracted ray, and our refracted angle all lie on the one plane. So if they come in on the X plane, they will come out on the X plane. If they were to go in on the Y plane, they would also come out on the Y plane. Okay. And here's our second law of refraction. That sine I over sine R is equal to a constant number N. Regardless of what angle we have our incoming angle, the refracted angle will always match it to give a constant number n. Okay. <clears throat> so basically the refractive index or that refractive number n is a measure of how much the material can bend or can refract light. So the refractive index of a material is a ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction when light travels from air into that material. So refractive index of air is roughly 1. The refractive index of water is around 1.33. And of glass, it varies from 1.5 to 1.6. And for diamond, it's 2.4. Again, the refractive index is a measure of how much that material can bend or refract the light. Obviously, we can see diamond can bend or can refract light the most by comparison to water, which will bend it the least. Okay. Due to the refraction of an object in a liquid, it appears less deep than it actually is. Okay. So as we now should be aware, and we can see, we've seen it in our first um, picture, water can bend light and as a result of doing that something that is underwater or submerged in water will appear less deep than it actually is when we look or when we view that object at at an angle okay so the apparent depth decreases as you view that object more from this from the side we can see here In diagram one versus diagram two versus diagram three. Diagram three, the object appears least deep. Okay, so the greater the angle you view an object from, the le the more the light gets bent. Therefore, the more or the less deep the object appears. Okay, and again, we've got a formula for this where n is your refractive index is equals to the real depth of the object over the apparent depth. Okay. Again, the refractive index in terms of its relative speed, light will be traveling through those objects at a certain speed. The, more, the higher the refractive index, the greater the change in speed. Okay. So again, diamond will slow down light the most while water will slow down light the least, but they all will change the speed at which 
the light is traveling through that material. So again, we've got our refractive index N is equals to sine I over sine R, or it's also equals to the speed of the material in air versus the speed, sorry, the speed of light in air versus the speed of light in the material through which it's traveling. Okay, and we can see there's our formula for that. Again, it's another formula that we need to be familiar with. Okay, so moving on now. In this case, guys, what we've got occurring here is we've got light traveling from a more dense to a less dense material. And we can see when it's traveling from more dense to less dense material, rather than traveling in a straight line, the light ray gets refracted away from the normal. So what's happening here is, as we continue to increase the incident angle, the light ray is refracting more and more and more. Eventually, you will increase the incident angle to a point where the refracted ray no longer leaves and goes into the second material, but instead travels along the plane or along the surface between the two materials, between the water and the air. At this point, where the ref angle of refraction is 90 degrees, the angle of incidence is referred to as the critical angle. Okay? If you go beyond the critical angle, if you continue to increase your incident angle beyond the critical angle, we can see that the light ray now, rather than leaving and going into the second material, it actually reflects back into the uh, back into the material, the water that it came that it, the light ray came from. So rather than the light ray traveling into the air, it actually reflects back underneath the water again and this is called total internal reflection okay so again a critical angle when light is traveling from a more dense to a less dense material or medium the angle of incidence whose angle of refraction is 90 degrees is called the critical angle so we can see here our angle of refraction is at 90 degrees to our normal and therefore the corresponding angle of incidence is referred to as the critical angle. So the critical angle is the angle where the refracted angle is equal to 90 degrees. When light is going from a more dense to a less dense material and it strikes the rarer medium at an angle greater than the critical angle it does not enter the second medium or the second material. Instead, it's reflected back into the denser material and this is known as total internal reflection. So, we can see we've gone beyond the critical angle here now and our light is now, rather than heading out into our second medium, into the air, the light ray has been reflected back into the glass again. And this is known as total internal reflection. Okay, so hopefully in class again, you would have set up this experiment where we seen whereby light um, is shone through a semicircular glass block. And what's happening is we've reached a critical angle here now where instead of the light traveling out into the air, it's just traveling along the surface of the glass block. If you continue to increase that critical angle, what's instead happening is total internal reflection is occurring. The light ray is traveling back into the glass block. So we've got another formula for this again, where N, the refractive index of that material, is equals to one over sine of our critical angle C. So if you know the critical angle C, we can find the refractive index or vice versa. If you know the refractive index, you can find the critical angle of that material. Now, we can use this 
phenomenon to bend light through 90 degrees using a glass prism. So what we've got here is a light ray coming in, striking our uh, diagonal surface of our prism at an ang incident angle of 45 degrees and rather than it passing back out into the air, it bends back into the glass, uh, re reflects back into glass at an angle of 45 degrees. We can also use this to turn a light ray at 180 degrees. So we've got a light ray incoming here. Again, strikes our angle of 45 degrees. Rather than heading back out into the air, it totally internally reflects, hits this other surface of the glass. Again, rather than leaving and heading back out into the air, it bends again or reflects again at 45 degrees and travels back out. And here we've turned our light ray by a total of 180 degrees. Okay. Using this phenomenon, we have created things like optical fibers, which are very thin transparent rods, usually made from glass, through which light can travel by total internal reflection. So fiber optic cables, how our broadband hopefully is coming into the majority of our homes is through our fiber cables. And that is these transparent rods, which um, light can totally internally reflect through. So here's an idea of how small these fiber optic cables can be, where we've got light traveling through the eye of a needle. Okay, so the key thing to note with these fiber optic cables, guys, is that they are not hollow cables. They are, um, they are whole, they are made from glass, which allows light to just travel through. And we can see here, what we've got, rather than just our, if we had two fiber optic cables touching, light may escape and pass from one to another. So what we do to ensure this doesn't happen is we put a coating around these fiber optic cables and this ensures that the light travels or continues to bounce or totally internally reflect through uh, the cable and it also prevents damage to the inner, the inner fiber. Okay, so some uses of this are endoscopic images of our fetuses or of a fetus. Um, we can be used through in bicycle reflectors and reflective road signs and um, in telecommunications, as we mentioned already. So these are all applications of total internal reflection. Okay, a mirage is also Another example of how total internal reflection can occur, whereby when you see a shiny puddle or what looks like a shimmer on the, um, on the ground, that's actually what you're seeing is the sky above you. Okay, so images are being totally internally reflected back onto the ground. So guys, I hope this helps you with a better or gives you a better understanding of refraction. Um, and thank you very much for watching. Okay guys, welcome back to the second half of this video where we're continuing on from refraction and we're going to have a look at lenses now. So our learning intention is we've got a couple of definitions again, quite a few definitions in this video that you guys need to become familiar with. Firstly, what a converging versus a diverging lens is, the optic center, the focal length, real image and virtual images. We would have touched on them in previous chapters, magnification and the power of a lens. You need to be able to differentiate between short-sighted and long-sighted and what lenses are used to correct both of these defects. And we're going to draw light ray diagrams for both concave and convex lens, practical uses for lenses and you've got an experiment to measure the focal length of a converging lens. So up next, we've got a difference here between the two. What's a converging lens versus what's a diverging lens? Okay, we can see firstly on the left here, let me get my pointer, here we've got our converging lens, also known as a convex lens. It's thicker at the center and narrower at the top and the bottom. 
versus our concave or our diverging lens on the right here. It's thicker at the top and the bottom and it's um, caving in at the center, okay? Also known as a diverging lens. So the optic center in both cases, guys, is the very middle point of the lens. Again, we've got our principal axis traveling straight through our two lens and our optic, optic center is that center point where the uh, principal axis travels through the center of the lens. Um, again, rather than just having one focus, we've got a focus either side of our lenses now, guys, and be aware the distance from the focus to the optic center, if it's 10 centimeters on one side, must also be 10 centimeters on the other side. They're the same distances. Make sure when drawing these diagrams, you measure that out correctly. So, a convex lens, or it's known as a converging lens. The reason being, we can see here, we've got parallel light rays traveling in, and what happens is, these light rays converge at a single point. They're converging at the focal point, okay? Hence why a convex lens is also known as a converging lens. Up next, we've got our concave lens, easy to remember because it caves in at the center. Our concave lens is also known as a diverging lens because while we've got three light rays traveling in here, rather than the three of them converging at a, the focus like they did earlier on, they, they, in this case, they're diverging light. They're diverging the three light rays. Now, if you were to trace these light rays back, backwards, like we've done in previous chapters, you'll find that they uh, converge behind at the focus again, or at that focal length. Okay, so that's our difference between our converging and our diverging lens. Okay, now, like with our mirrors, we've got some rules or some laws that we need to follow or need to be aware of. First up, if we've got a light ray coming in and it strikes the optic center, it travels straight on through it does not bend or it does not, um, it does not bend or refract in any way. However, if we've got a light ray traveling in parallel to the principal axis, when it travels through our converging lens, parallel to the principal axis, out through the focus on the far side. Okay, in this case, if we've got a light ray coming through the focus and then hits our converging lens, if it comes through the focus, it comes out parallel to the axis on the other side of the lens. So again, a real image guys is formed by the actual intersection and that word actual is very, very important. Um, that is a real image, okay? A real image, like with our mirrors, can be projected onto a screen. A virtual image, is formed by the apparent intersection of light rays. And that word apparent is the key thing here, guys. It's the apparent intersection of light rays. That cannot be projected onto a screen. Okay, so what we're gonna have a look at now is a couple of diagrams showing how we've got an object on one side of a lens and where the image is going to form. Okay, so we've got three light rays here, right? Just label them, got light ray one, two, and three. Light ray one, guys, traveling in parallel to the principal axis, like so, comes out through the focal point on the far side of the lens. Light ray two, light ray two travels straight, straight through the optic center, does not diverge or does not bend in any way, travels straight on through and light ray three travels through the focal length. And if it travels through the focal length or focal point, hits our, hits our lens, travels out parallel the same parallel to the principal axis on the other side of the lens. Now, where our light rays intersect is where our image is going to form. And we can see a position X here is where our light ray, our light rays intersect. So there is where our image is going to form. Now, similar to our mirrors, <clears throat> we notice in this case, the image is below the principal axis while the object 
is above the principal axis. So our image has been inverted or flipped upside down. What we'll also notice is our image is slightly smaller. So it's been made a little bit smaller as well. Okay, up next guys, like with our mirrors again, depending on where our object is positioned, let me just get a pen, we've got diagram one, diagram two, and diagram three. We can see depending on where our object is positioned, our image will form slightly differently. So in diagram one, our object is behind two times the focal length. And our rules never change. In parallel to the principal axis, out through the focal point. Through the optic center does not does not change its course. And we can see that here our image is diminished. If our object, however, is placed on two times the focal length, it still is inverted, it's still upside down, but it comes out at position two times the focal length on the far side of the lens the same size. However, if the object is placed inside two times the focal length, well then remember our light rays, our rules never change. In parallel to the principal axis, out through the focal point on the far side, through the optic center, does not diverge, does not bend in any way, straight through. Where our light rays intersect is where our image is going to form. And in diagram three down the bottom, we can see in this case, our image is magnified. So that's just detailed view at those three diagrams. Guys, we need to be aware, we need to be able to draw these diagrams, so practice doing that. Now, again, if we place our object on the focal length, something funny happens. Your rules never change. In parallel, out through the focal point through the optic center does not diverge. And what you see here is we've got two parallel lines. Parallel lines, they never intersect, neither going forwards nor going backwards. So therefore that will always be an image at infinity, meaning the image will be blurry. You'll never get a clear image forming. However, if you take your object inside the focal length, like we can see in our second diagram here, something else happens. Rules never change in parallel to the principal axis, out through the focal point. Through the optic center, continue on the same path, does not diverge in any way. On the far side of our lens, we can see these light rays are diverging, they're getting further away from each other. So they're not going to meet behind the lens or on the right hand side of the lens. However, if we trace these backwards, we can see that they will eventually intersect. Now, because it's the apparent intersection due to these dotted lines here, this is a virtual image and it's going to be magnified. We can see it's upright, it's magnified, but it's a virtual image. This cannot be projected onto a screen. Again, that's those two diagrams again in detail. Need to be able to draw these diagrams, guys. Okay. So, our formula now for our converging lens. Nice and simple, this is, well, it's in our log tables, so that will help us out certainly. One over U plus one over V is equals to one over F. F represents the focal length. U represents the distance from the object to the optic center of the lens. And V represents the distance from the image to the optic center, okay? So, and then F is the distance from the focal point to the optic center. If it's a real image, we've got a positive in front of our uh, image V. If it's a virtual image, it's going to be a negative <coughs> in front of our image V. Again, our formula for magnification is V over U, ver our image distance over our object distance. Okay, to see whether it's magnified or diminished. Up next, we've got our diverging lens, also known as a concave lens. Our rules, slightly similar, but we need to know the differences. They're small differences, guys. They're intricate, so it takes a little bit of time to study these in order to get them correct. The first one, however, is the same as our converging lens. 
light ray traveling towards our optic center continues to travel in a straight line on through okay passes straight through if a light ray is coming in and it looks like it's heading or it's heading towards the focal length what happens is it does not head towards the focal length because it's going to refract it's going to bend and it bends parallel to the principal axis on the far side of the diverging lens Up next if it's coming if we've got a light ray coming in parallel to the principal axis it will diverge out or spread out as if it's coming from the focal point okay so it emerges as if it came from the focal point and what we can do now is we can combine these rules to see where our image is going to form okay so here we've got our object outside the focal point our first light ray sorry there we go our first light ray parallel to the principal axis and it's coming out diverging out as if it came from the focal point our second light ray heading straight for the optic center and it passes straight through now let's have a look on the right hand side of our lens these two light rays are diverging they're never going to meet so therefore we have to trace them backwards and we find here when we trace them backwards is where they intersect and here is where our image is going to form in a diverging lens the image is always virtual which means it's always going you're always going to have to trace your light rays backwards it's always going to be upright we can see it's on the same side of the principal axis as our object it's above the principal axis and it's diminished we can see it's much smaller okay the image will always be on the same side of the lens as the object it will never appear on the right hand side of our lens okay so because it's always going to be a virtual image we've got a minus here in front of our v for our image and we've got a minus in front of our focal length as well Up next guys, we're going to have a look at the power of a lens. Simply given, power is given by a capital P and it's equals to one over the focal length, okay? Now, things to note, that focal length, if you're given that, uh, if you're given that measurement in centimeters, always convert it into meters. So if you're given 20 centimeters, convert it into 0 0.2 meters. And let's have a look here. We can see, the shorter the focal length, hopefully, the more powerful the lens is. Here we've got a longer focal length and the lens is not as powerful. Whereas at the diagram on the left, we can see there's a huge amount of um there's a huge amount of refraction occurring here. So shorter the focal length, greater the power. Again, in this case, the shorter the focal length, the greater the ability to diverge that light ray. Or those light rays so we said that the SI unit for a power of a lens is per meter so we always need to ensure that our focal length is given in meters not in centimeters a converging lens has a positive power while a diverging lens has a negative power okay so we need to use a negative sign when talking about a diverging lens if you two lenses combined, the total power is equal to the power of the first lens plus the power of the second lens. Now, if you put a diverging lens in there, well, then you need to subtract one from the other. Okay. Excuse me a second. So, our eye acts as a lens and we can see we've got a lens bang here in the middle of our eye and the reason for that is that we can bend light and get that light to bend and focus on the retina which is like the screen at the back of our eye okay so depending on whether we're in a very bright room or a very dark room these ciliary muscles 
above and below the lens will either uh, contract or extend to change the shape of our lens so that light always gets focused onto the retina at the back of our eye. Then our retina is connected to an optic nerve which takes these signals to our brain and our brain converts them into the images that we see every day. Okay, which is pretty incredible. Um, when a real image is brought into focus on the retina, the object can be seen clearly like in this diagram. So we've got our lens in the middle of our eye and we can see our image is forming directly on the retina and that's great. However, if the object is brought into focus behind the retina, well then the image will appear blurry. Likewise, if it's brought into focus below, before the retina, like in this case, our retina is the back screen, the screen at the back of our eye, if it's brought into focus before that, again, the image will appear blurry. And in this case, someone who is short-sighted can see nearby objects but cannot see distant objects clearly. And the correction for short-sightedness is to use a diverging lens. And what happens here, if we have a look at the diagram on the left, first up, we can see that the image is appearing in the center of the eye while it should be appearing at the retina at the back of the eye. So what we can do is take a diverging lens which actually spreads out the light rays ever so much. And therefore, when they're spread out, by the time that our, the lens of our eye uh, gets hold of those two light rays, it will then converge them at the back of the eye, at the retina, where we want the image, or where we want the light rays to intersect. And now we've got a clear image forming, which is brilliant. Someone who's long-sighted, uh, can see distant objects clearly, but cannot see nearby objects. So we can see here, this is long sighted because while we want our image forming on the retina, we can see the image isn't forming till behind the eye, which is uh, no good. So what we can do, we can see the lens, our lens is not strong enough to get the light rays to focus on our retina. So what we do is we put another converging lens or convex lens in front of our eye and this focuses, it, this focuses the light ray and then the lens of our eye focuses the light rays one more time and now our light rays are intersecting at the retina at the back of our eye and we get a clear image forming. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you guys. Thank you again for watching this video. All the best.